I'm going to read uh, first of all from the book of Leviticus, uh, which uh, you will be able to find on page 113, uh, starting at chapter, chapter 13, um, verses 1 to 8, and then the last two verses of that chapter. And uh, this contains Jewish laws concerning those with skin diseases, including leprosy. And then I'm going to go straight on to chapter uh, to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter one, uh, the end of chapter one, uh, going through to chapter two, verse seventeen. And you can find that in your Bibles on page one thousand and three. Regulations about defiling skin diseases. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when anyone has a swelling or a rash or a shiny spot on their skin that may be a defiling skin disease, they must be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons who is a priest. The priest is to examine the sore on the skin and if the hair in the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be more than skin deep, it is a defiling skin disease. When the priest examines that person, he shall pronounce them ceremonially unclean. If the shiny spot on the skin is white but does not appear to be more than skin deep, and the hair in it has not turned white, the priest is to isolate the affected person for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine them, and if he sees that the sore is unchanged, and has not spread in the skin, he's to isolate them for another seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine them again, and if the sore has faded and has not spread in the skin, the priest shall pronounce them clean. It is only a rash. They must wash their clothes, and they will be clean. But if the rash does spread in their skin, after they have shown themselves to the priest to be pronounced clean, They must appear before the priest again. The priest is to examine that person, and if the rash has spread in the skin, he should pronounce them unclean. It is a defiling skin disease. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees. If you are willing You can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest And offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, 
thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, and there were many who followed him, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Father God, I pray that wherever we're coming from today, we would have an encounter with your son, the risen Lord Jesus, through the preaching of your word. And as we encounter him, it would be life transforming for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Well, hi, everyone. Let me have my welcome to Pete. Great to see you all here as we continue this sermon series in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the very first written account uh, of the life of Jesus Christ. And what a passage we have before us today. Three episodes, three encounters with Jesus Christ, and three people's lives radically transformed for the better. The author Mark is writing a punchy, fast-paced account of the life of Jesus. And he often strings together several episodes in quick succession to make a point, as he's doing here, in this instance, to show us the life-changing power and love of this man, Jesus, from Nazareth. And here's the thing about these three stories. These are not stories, ancient stories locked in the past. You can encounter this same Jesus today, such that these stories can become part of your story and your life radically transformed in a similar way. So if you're someone here looking into Christian things, it's great to have you here. Jesus wants you to encounter him today, right now. And if you're someone here used to Christian things, well, this is how Jesus wants us to continue to encounter him each day. So let's look at these stories now. We'll look at them one by one. First with the leper in verses 40 to 55, where we see Jesus is willing to cleanse us from the terrible effects of sin. Jesus is willing to cleanse us from the terrible effects of sin. Glance down at verse 40 on page 1003. A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him, on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. So here is a man in desperate need of help. Here is a man begging Jesus to do something about his leprosy. Now, if you don't know, back then, leprosy was the most feared disease of the day. 
caused by a bacterial infection that would eat away at your skin and eat away even at your nerve endings so you would lose the sensation of pain. Dr. Paul Brand, one of the leading experts when it comes to leprosy in the 20th century, once described having it as a painless hell. He used to send his clients back home in India with a cat by their side so that they would chase away the rats that would otherwise gnaw away at the victim's feet because they weren't aware that it was happening. It is a horrific disease. But that is nothing compared to the social stigma attached to leprosy. And I'm not sure if you followed that Old Testament reading from Leviticus, but those last two verses are very sober indeed. If you had leprosy back then at that time, the Old Testament law, because of the risk of contagion, you had to go around with your clothes torn which back then was what mourners did at a funeral. But now you're mourning at your own funeral because you're like a dead man walking. You had to live alone. You had to live away from the community, outside the camp. And if you ever came across someone in the street, you actually had to shout out, unclean, unclean. So the person could see who you were and walk around you on the other side. I mean, can you imagine how humiliating, how painful, how isolating it must have been to have leprosy? It didn't just rob you of your health, it robbed you of everything, your friends, your family. Imagine people avoiding you, keeping their distance children running away in fear of you, not being able to make love to your spouse, not being able to hug your children. The only human interaction you would have was with other lepers in the colony, faces deformed, walking around on their stumps. Some in the most final serious phase of leprosy, a constant reminder to you of where your life was heading. Here is a man in desperate need of help. No cure. People back then said it was easy to, as easy to raise someone from the dead as it was to hear someone heal someone from leprosy. In desperate need, he is begging Jesus. He's on his knees. No doubt he's heard about this guy, Jesus. No do, knows about this healing he's doing. And he says to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He does not doubt Jesus' power. He knows he can do it. But will he do it? Will Jesus reach out to someone like me when everybody else is turning away and avoiding me? And Jesus reaches out his hand and touches him. That is how willing Jesus is. He could have healed him from afar, be clean, and he could have kept his distance. But he reaches right in. He touches the man. He goes where no one else wants to go with him. That is what Jesus is like. That is what he's prepared to do, to enter into our pain and suffering, to reach out to us where we are at, no matter the cost to him. He's willing to cleanse this man, to deal with the terrible effects of a fallen world. Jesus was indignant, verse 41. Indignant is to have a strong anger towards things that are wrong. And Jesus is not indignant at the man, right? He's indignant at his leprosy. He's indignant at all suffering, sickness, and disease. He can't stand them. And finally, a human touch, someone prepared to touch him. That's what makes Jesus so captivating. The way he reaches out and touches this man, be clean, and immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Not just healed, he was cleansed. So all the social stigma is over as well. No more torn clothes, no more living alone. Where's the family? Where are my kids? He's not just got his health back, he's got everything back.
That is what an encounter with Jesus Christ is like. Don't you want that sort of encounter today? Now, do not get me wrong. I doubt any of us here are dealing with leprosy. But we are all dealing, suffering with the terrible effects of living in a fallen world. And the consequence of that first sin. Our own suffering, our own sickness, our own disease, our own social stigma perhaps attached to some of that. Perhaps you're feeling helpless, perhaps there is no known cure, but here, do you see, there is someone who can change things in an instant with just a touch. If only we would go to him. (coughs) Often it's not God's power, we doubt. You can make me clean, it's often God's love, we doubt. Are you willing? Be in no doubt when it comes to Jesus Christ. He is willing, and he has promised one day to cleanse the whole world. Trust in him. He will make you whole again. And for those of us here who are trusting in Jesus Christ, well, look, there's a challenge here for us to follow Jesus in the way he loves people. To follow Jesus in the way he reaches out and touches those who are, quite frankly, according to the world, untouchable. Will we move out to the outsiders today, the ostracized, the marginalized today, those whom the world has forgotten about? If we're anything like me, our instincts is to hold back, to protect ourselves, to leave it for other people to do. Perhaps we don't realise how life-giving our touch can be. As we love like Jesus, as we point people to Jesus, he is willing, are you? Now, there is quite a sour note to the end of this episode, in verses 43 to 45, and that is actually the man disobeys Jesus. Did you see that? Jesus gives him a strong warning not to tell anyone what's just happened, but the man disobeys him and goes and tells everyone. And as a result of that, where does Jesus end up? Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, verse 45, but stays outside in lonely places. But look, that brings us on appropriately to the second episode and the second encounter with Jesus because he's not come just to deal with the effects of sin. He's prepared to go much deeper than that and to forgive our sins and to deal with sin itself. That's this encounter with the paralytic. Might be very familiar to you, um, this account, and because it's very familiar, it is easy for us to miss the shock of it. Because verse 5 comes completely out of nowhere. Here are four men, they have this paralytic friend, and they bring him to Jesus. I imagine they've heard about Jesus' healings, heard what Jesus can do, Jesus is nearby, they bring their paralytic friend to him. They even destroy someone's roof to make sure that they can get their friend to Jesus. And Jesus sees their faith, he turns to the man, and what does he say? Son, your legs are healed, get up, take your mat and walk. Except he doesn't say that, does he? We'd expect him to say that, he's been saying that to everyone else, healing everyone else, he completely ignores his legs. Son, your sins are forgiven. And I wonder how you react to that. Do you think, that is amazing. Jesus has forgiven his sins. That's unbelievable. Or do you tend to think, like I tend to think, well, yeah, that's great, well done, Jesus, but look at his legs. The man can't walk. Are you not going to do anything about that? And that just goes to show that I am still yet to fully grasp the seriousness of our sin. Sin is a personal offence against our creator God. Every time we hurt one another, every time we don't 
live God's way in God's world. That is cosmic treason against an infinitely holy God. Of course Jesus can see his legs are broken. But he knows there's something far more serious than that. And that is this man's broken relationship with God. Fix his legs, great. He can walk again for the rest of his life, but how will that help him on judgment day? Fix his relationship with God. That will change his life, not just for now, but forever. Son, your sins are forgiven. The most precious words this man will ever hear. Back in 2011, a guy called Li Fuan from China, age 30, goes into hospital. He has um, breathing difficulties. He has headaches. He has persistent bad breath. And because it's quite serious, because it's been going on for quite a few years, the doctors decide to take an X-ray uh, of him, his upper body and his head. And this is what they discovered, if you can see on the screen behind me, the image here. If you can't see very well on the big screen, turn around to that little screen up there. But do you see that thing at the bottom in the middle, held by the hand? That is a knife, that is a four-inch blade. And if you look carefully up into the top left, you'll see that blade inside this man's head. And he had been carrying this around for four years. Now, you might think to yourself, yeah, how did he not realize? Perhaps you think, how did it get in there? Well, what happened four years ago was he was robbed and he was stabbed, but he thought the person must have missed because he didn't feel anything, but he hadn't missed. It went straight in, missed all his organs, and just got lodged in there for four years. So here's this man. He's thinking, can I have some aspirin for my headache? Can I have some mints for my bad breath? Can I have some oxygen for my breathing difficulties? And the doctor takes one look at the x-ray and you know, says, you've got a far bigger problem than that. Well, look... In a similar sort of way, so it is with us and God. Jesus looks at this man's legs, looks through them to the man's heart, and knows he has a much bigger problem than his paralysis. Our number one problem is not global warming, it's not political unrest, it's not suffering sickness, disease, or any broken bones. It is a broken relationship with God. Every issue in the world, everything that has gone on in this world that is wrong, all of it can be traced back to the problem of sin, be it my sin, your sin, someone else's sin, or the very first sin in the Garden of Eden. That is humanity's number one problem. That is your and mine number one problem. But do you see, here is someone who can deal with that sin itself. Some daughter your sins are forgiven. Not that the teachers of the law are happy about it. Verse 6, we read, Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. Notice there how nothing escapes Jesus. He sees everything. He knows every thought of our hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Because Jesus heals the man's legs anyway to show the authority he has. He calls himself the son of man. That is Daniel 7, an Old Testament figure, one who has all authority over all people for all time, one who even has authority to forgive sins. 
Now, fair play to the teacher of the law. Let's not be quick to accuse him. Their theology is right. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Sin's a personal offense against God. Only he can forgive sins. Their theology is right. It's just the application of their theology which is not right. Any other human being, they are spot on. He is blaspheming. But Jesus Christ is not any other human being. He is God's king, bringing in God's kingdom, a kingdom of forgiveness, of restored relationship with God. Fully human, fully divine. That is who Jesus is. It's just that they can't see it. Can I ask, can you see it? Because here is someone who can deal with our greatest problem. Now, we might not come to church today with any broken bones, and I sure don't hope you've come to church with a four-inch blade in your skull. But each of us are carrying inside of us something far more serious. The problem of sin, the brokenness that ensues. But if we turn to him and put our faith in Jesus Christ, as these men did, well, he can change things in an instant. Son, daughter, mum, dad, your sins are forgiven. If you've not turned to him yet, please turn to him. There is no greater need in life. And if you've done so already, let's continue to point other people to him as well. I know we find it hard, hard to talk about sin. I know there can be a cost to mention Jesus and talk about him. But there's nothing more loving we can do for any human being to give them the opportunity to hear for themselves those words from God, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. And that brings us on to the third episode and this final encounter with Jesus. Not only has he come to deal with the effects of sin, not only has he come to deal with sin itself, he actually calls all sinners, all people, you, me, to himself. Verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Do you want to know what it's like to have been a tax collector at that time? Listen to the words of this commentator. When a Jew entered the customs service and became a tax collector, he was regarded as an outcast from society. He was disqualified as a judge or a witness in a court session. He was excommunicated from the synagogue and in the eyes of the community, a disgrace that extended to his whole family. But here is Jesus covering his shame and disgrace. Follow me. Who, me? A sinner? Yes, you. And Levi got up and followed him. Now, again, teacher of the law aren't too happy about this. In verse 15, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teacher of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, do you see what Jesus is saying here? Because so many people get this wrong today. Jesus is not interested in good people. Jesus is not interested in good people. That's not why he's come. He's come for sinners. He's come for those in need of help. Are you in need of help? Jesus has come for you. I know of at least two people who will not come to this church because they think they are too bad for God. The things I have done, if only you knew. And they think that their sin somehow disqualifies them from God and from church. And they can't believe that Jesus would come 
for people like them. He has. And for people like you and me. Now, of course, we're all sinners, right? We all need help. Jesus has come for all of us. It's just that the Pharisees can't see it. They won't admit their need. But because they won't admit their need, they are potentially missing out on the one cure they desperately need. Did you know that men are more likely to die young because they refuse to go to the doctor? That is according to research done a couple of years ago for the Journal of Preventative Medicine. Not all men, just macho men who think that going to the doctor is for wimps and that men should man up and deal with the symptoms of an illness themselves. Although in some tragic cases, they, these people didn't realise actually how serious the symptoms were and they were the early signs of either a fatal heart disease or a life-threatening cancer. Imagine trying to console a mother who has lost her son because he wouldn't admit his need and get the cure that he required. And yet, how many people today are doing just the same thing with their sin? I'm all right. I'm, quite, I'm a good person. I try my best. I mean, no one's perfect, are they? Why should God let me into heaven? Well, you know, look, I've done this, I've done that. Not as bad as that person over there. Thinking you're okay with God, thinking nothing's wrong, and we miss out on the one cure we all need. I have not come to call the righteous, I have come to call sinners. Are you a sinner? Do you see you're a sinner? Jesus has come for you. He loves you. He wants to reach out to you with a life-giving touch to forgive your sin, to transform your life now and for eternity. but I just can't forgive myself. Well, look, fine, what you did was probably very, very wrong, and the guilt is real. But you're not God. God is God. And he says he's come for you, and he's calling you to himself. So stop beating yourself up. Stop trying to pay for that sin yourself. And come to the one who has paid for your sin himself. The one who on the cross became an ultimate outsider. You know, so we could become an insider. He was forsaken for our sin on the cross. So we could be forgiven for our sin. And Jesus was broken on the cross in ways we can't begin to imagine so that you and I could have our relationship with God restored and one day be made whole again. And you and I truly can hear those words from God for us today, truly, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. He has come for you. Why won't you go to him and continue to point others to him. Let me pray for us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much indeed for these three, three beautiful vignettes in the life of Jesus Christ. How we see how willing Jesus is to touch the untouchable, to reach out, to deal with the terrible effects of sin. But not just that, he has the authority to forgive our sins, no matter the cost to himself, the cost of his own life. And he's come for all of us. All sinners, pleased by your spirit, would we see our need? Would he would never be macho about our sin, or man or woman up about it. Deal with it ourselves. Would we bring it to him, confess our sin, receive his forgiveness. Let these stories become part of our story. See that life-transforming power and love at work in us, this church, and where we live this week and beyond, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.